Hi, I'm Curran. This video is about recreating this bar chart using D3. Around the time of that white supremacist rally in Charlottesville, I started thinking, is there any way data visualization could be applied you know, to this scenario? And I came across this great tweet by Mona Chalabi. It's a hand-drawn data visualization that says, if this bar represents all murders by extremists since 2005, in the US that is, these are the right-wing murders, and these are the white supremacist murders. I wondered, what is the source of this data? But if you scroll down, she provides the source. It's actually from this text in this article. So what I'm doing here is I'm typing out this data, just in terms of text. This data will be the basis for our D3 reconstruction of this bar chart. Next, what I'll do is switch over to blockbuilder.org, which is a really great tool for rapid prototyping. You can develop code in the browser, and it's built for developing D3-based visualizations. I pasted that data in there as text that I typed out. Now I'm going to reorganize it into an array of JavaScript objects, each of which has a name and a value. Next, I'll get rid of the boilerplate code that was there, and I'll create the X scale, a linear scale that will be used to define the length of these bars in the bar chart. I'll set the domain to go from 0 to the maximum value from the data, and I'll set the range to go from 0 to inner width. The inner width needs to be computed from the width and the margin, both of which are not defined yet. So I'll define the margin to have left and right margins. These are the spaces on the left and right. And then I'll define width to be 960. And we're going to need height too, so while I'm at it, I'll say the height is 500. These values of 960 and 500 are what's used on blocks.org, which we'll use to publish this example. Now we have everything we need to properly compute inner width and inner height, the dimensions of our visualization rectangle that the bars are going to go inside. Next, I'll create the Y scale, which will be a scale band, and set the domain to be each name in the data, and set the range to go from inner height to zero. This will define bands that will define the width and position of the bars. Then I'll create some rectangles using a D3 data join, and then pass in the data, and then for X and Y, I'll use the X scale, and I'll get the X and Y values for each row and pass it through the X and Y scales. I'll define these X and Y value accessor functions as functions that just return the value and the name. Then I'll define the width and height of these rectangles. For the width, we'll use the x scale, and for the height, we'll use the band width. This is the width of each individual band. All right, so we're not getting anything. What happened here? The SVG is empty. Oh, right, I didn't complete the pattern. It needs to be select all rect dot data, and then we need to use dot enter to handle the case where there's a data value and there's not any DOM element yet. But we want to put all this stuff inside the margin. So I'll add a group element that gets transformed by the margin left and also the margin top. Now if we add the rectangles to this group element, they get translated by the margin. The bars are all touching each other, so we can adjust the padding to separate them out a little bit. All these functions are well documented in the D3 scale package. So if I set the padding to 0.1, this is what we see. All right, this is starting to look pretty close to what we want. I'll tweak the padding a bit more. And then what I want to do is reverse the order to match the sketch. And where we need to do that is when we set the domain of the Y scale. Let's take a look at the original and see what else we need. We need these text values and also the numbers. 
What I'm going to do is replace the rectangles with groups. Group elements can contain other elements. So each of these group elements will contain a rectangle and also a text label. We can transform these group elements by the X and Y that we were using previously for the rectangles. Now all the rectangles inside of these group elements get transformed because their parent element is transformed. Now that we have groups, we can append text elements, one for each rectangle. If we append a text element to the enter selection of these groups, and we set the text to be the Y value, we get these labels here. They're not styled very well, so I'm going to give them a class. Then we can use CSS to set, for example, the font size to be larger. We can also set the font family to make it look more sleek. I'll make it white so we can see it on top of the bars. Then I'll set the Y attribute to be the bandwidth so that our text is aligned to the bottom. Then I can tweak the CSS alignment and then use bandwidth divided by two to get our text to be centered vertically on the bars. I'll modify the X attribute of the text to give it a little bit of padding on the left. Now let's add those numbers that appear at the ends of the bars. We can use the same pattern that we use for the labels. This time we give it a class of number. And we can use mostly the same CSS except for the fill being white. Now we do have numbers at the edge of our bars. We want to format this text as percentages though, so what we can do is use ES6 template literals to say, okay, we want the X value, which is the count, and then in parentheses, we want the percentage that that actually is. And then we can make a new function called X percent that will compute that percentage by dividing the X value by the second number in the scale domain, which is the max. I always forget about how to use D3 format, so I like to Google this nice example by Zan Armstrong. From here, we can see that this comma percent is what we want to add a percentage sign after the number. That's not quite right. We just want one decimal point of precision, so we can add a point 0.1 there to make that happen. I'll make these numbers a bit smaller because they're running off the screen. Now, these bars represent murders, right? So I want to make it kind of like blood red. So I can style the bars by using the bar class. Um, but for that, we need to set the bar class on the rectangles. All right, now that CSS gets applied. These numbers seem a bit close to the bars, you know, a bit too close for comfort. So I'll just add five, you know, or eight to that X position there to give them a little padding with respect to the bars. Oh no, there's actually two percent signs going on. We have it in our template and also in the formatter, so I'll just remove it from the template. 100 goes off the edge, so let's adjust the margin so that these numbers all fit on the screen. I'd like to make this text also that same color, so I can do that by setting the fill on the number class. All right, we're pretty close. I think the only thing we need now is a title. And to add a title, we can add a text element to the SVG and set the text to be murders in the US. Now we need to tweak the X and Y values to position it. And we can set a class of, say, subtitle so that we can use CSS to style this text as well. I'll style it the same as the numbers. Then I'll copy this note that I had from earlier that the data is actually from July 2005 to June 2015, which I think is an important fact that should not be omitted from the visualization. Now we can just tweak the X and Y so that the title is uh, positioned re reasonably, and we can actually use margin.left to align it with the left of the bars. Now I'll change the title of our block and click Save. Each good block has a nice README 
So now I'm going to type out the readme of this block using Markdown. I'll link to the original tweet there. And also I'll link to the Instagram source. I'm also going to link to the original data source, which I think is essential for blocks. You know, visualizations should always point to the data that they're visualizing. I'll just note down the title here, and then I'll use that in the markdown. Now if I click Save, and then I click View Gist, I can actually clone this down to my machine using git clone and pasting that URL. Now I'm going to use this nice tool called gist snap, which actually generates this preview.png and thumbnail.png. These are the preview images that make this block appear nicely in the listing on blocks.org. Now I can go to my blocks.org page and it's there, we see the thumbnail is there, and if I click on it, this is what we see. I'll make a few minor adjustments here to make sure that we use our space well. Now I'll take a screenshot and then I'm going to actually respond to that tweet. I'm going to say, nice, here's a D3 replica and paste that in and then paste that link to that block that's newly published. I'll say it's done in hashtag d3.js and then I'll post it. And now if you click on that blocks link, you get this blocks page and you can see the data and also see the code. All right, now it's time to clean up the code. We did things sort of in a rush. So what I want to do is standardize ES6 because we're using some ES6 features like these arrow functions and then the template literals, but we're using var too, which sort of goes against ES6 best practices of using const and let. I'm going to dive into my tool of choice here, which is vim, so I can edit and, you know, do this stuff fast. All right, I'm going to replace all instances of var with const, because I don't think I'm ever reassigning any of these. Then I'll tweak the formatting of the CSS and then I'll just run through the code here, make sure I've got semicolons where they need to be, things like that. Then I'll indent the code so that our append and our enter are indented by two spaces, and all the .attrs are indented by four spaces. With D3, the indentation convention is expressions that create a new selection should be indented by two spaces, whereas Expressions that modify an existing selection, like .attr, should be indented by four spaces. All right, I'm done with Vim here, so I'm going to zoom out, copy this text, paste it into blockbuilder.org, and click Save. All right, there we go. That looks pretty much the way we wanted it to look. That's how you can use D3 to recreate a hand-drawn visualization.